But tonight, uh, I don't want to take too much time away from our speaker. Uh, we are very fortunate to have with us Dwight Hughes, and he'll be talking about the Monitor and the Virginia in his new book. Dwight S. Hughes writes and speaks on Civil War naval history. Lieutenant Commander Hughes was graduated from the Naval Academy in 1967 and served 20 years aboard warships on Navy staffs and with river forces in Vietnam. He holds an MA in political science and an MS in information systems management. Dwight authored a Confederate biography, The Cruise of the CSS Shenandoah in 2015 and is a contributing author at Emerging Civil War blog. So with that, uh, I will turn the screen over to our guest author, even though I do want to mention that Savas Beatty, the publisher, uh, has the book. And uh, if you go online and purchase from them and use the code virtual, which I'll also drop into the chat, uh, you can get 20% off. But without further ado, I'm going to uh, turn the screen over to our guest author. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Can uh, everybody see me okay? You doing all right. Hi, John. Good to see you. Um, okay. Well, we're going to talk about the Battle of Hampton Roads, a subject I'm sure many of you are familiar with, but <clears throat> hopefully you'll learn something new here. Um, I recommend to you our Emerging Civil War site. Um, and uh, there's my uh, personal website as well as my uh, email address. Uh, please get in touch with me if you have any, would like to talk more about uh, this subject or any other having to do with civil war and naval history. Uh, this is the book, uh, the, the new version. This is the first dedicated naval volume in the Emerging Civil War series, a, uh, a series I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, and uh, the, uh, the book you're going to hear soon about the uh, embattled capital is also part of this series, and the authors are, are good friends of mine, part of the group. Uh, so <laughs> that's my model for this for, for, for this book. If you don't know the story, that this is the place to begin. If you think you know the story, you might be surprised. So uh, getting underway here. Uh, well, it appears that my automation, these slides are supposed to fade in, but for some reason it's not working well. But anyway, uh, Saturday, March 8th, 1862, the revolutionary, not to say bizarre, ironclad USS Monitor entered Chesapeake Bay. She had rushed down from New York through gale force winds, almost sinking in the process. Monitor's mission was to defeat the powerful Confederate ironclad ram the CSS Virginia before she destroyed the wooden warships of the Union fleet in Hampton Roads. Monitor was a steam propelled iron plated raft with a cylindrical iron gun turret and two 11 inch guns. The flat expansive deck was barely a foot and a half above the surface. 14 officers and 57 crewmen were encased in the hull below the waterline. Captain John L. Warden ordered an exhausted and dispirited crew to strip the vessel of her sea rig and make every preparation for battle. To mid 19th century mariners, this enclosed cramped artificial space, which resembled future submarines, was a radical departure from sailing and fighting on the open decks and in the high rigging of the traditional man of war and not a little frightening. Monitor redefined the relationship between men and machines in war, challenging ancient concepts of honor and valor. These developments parallel the transformative combat experience of soldiers who began the conflict standing up in open fields, manful manfully confronting the enemy face to face, but ended up burrowing into trenches and crouching behind elaborate fortifications. Technology had advanced the defense over the offense. Paymaster William Keeler commented to his wife, you may rest assured that your better half will be in no more danger from rebel compliments 
than if he was seated with you at home. There isn't enough danger to give us any glory. Not a man is exposed to action or boilers in our machinery are completely and effectually protected. Monitor would become a cultural icon of American industrial strength and ingenuity in advertisements for everything from whiskey to refrigerators. She embodied social and institutional as well as industrial revolutions. But this would be largely a symbolic role, which would far outshine her actual accomplishments beyond a single engagement in a specific set of circumstances. After the battle, the Union caught monitor fever. 50 monitors would be built in a bewildering range of one, two, and three turret classes. But as a warship type, they were not up to the height and proved to be of limited utility. With their low profile, monitors were not seagoing vessels and were not effective against shore fortifications, although they did neutralize several Confederate ironclads. The most important technical innovation was the rotating armored turret, which would evolve into 20th century battleships. But during monitors' construction, public opinion had been decidedly ambivalent concerning this strange watercraft. The technological transition in one generation from timeless horse-drawn transportation to huge puffing locomotives had been breathtaking. On the water, tall warships had always inspired awe, but so far they look much the same, even when driven by steam as well as sail. It was not clear where a little monitor fit in this revolution. Was she even a ship or just a small ironclad two-gun battery that presumably floated and propelled itself? Many could not conceive that a slab of iron would even float. One Vermont reporter could hardly find words. Monitor is, unfact, is in fact unlike anything that ever floated on Neptune's bosom. The impression at a short distance is that of insignificance and harmlessness. But on standing upon its deck and looking upon it more closely, the impression is that is that of great power and invulnerability. The description of the Leviathan of the scriptures very adequately expresses the feeling which this sea monster excites. The vessel had a most singular appearance, wrote Chief Engineer Alvin C. Stewart. From a half mile distance, she appeared to be sinking. The hull was not visible while the turret sat upon the water by itself. People said she looked like a wash tub on a raft, a cheese box on a plank, a hat on a shingle, et cetera, et cetera. Nathaniel, Nathaniel Hawthorne would write, it looked like a gigantic rat trap. It was ugly, questionable, suspicious, evidently mischievous. Nay, I will allow myself to call it devilish. Monitor's Captain John L. Warden recalled, here was an unknown, untried vessel with all but a small portion below the waterline. Her crew to live with the ocean beating over their heads. It was an iron, coffin-like ship of which the gloomiest predictions were made. With her crew shut out from sunlight and the air above the sea, depending entirely on artificial means to supply the air they breathe. A failure of her machinery would be almost certain death to her men. Monitor proceeded across Chesapeake Bay as the evening descended. They heard heavy guns in the distance. Plumes of smoke hung over the land. Little black spots sprang into the air, paused for a moment, and expanded into large white clouds. Gun flashes lit the darkening horizon as bursting shells flashed in the air. The pilot informed them that the dreaded Virginia was raking havoc in, Kent, in Hampton Roads. The USS Cumberland was sunk. The USS Congress was ablaze. Numerous vessels were fleeing, quote, like a covey of frightened quails. Their lights danced over the water in all directions. The steam frigate USS Minnesota 
the most powerful ship the Navy could deploy, had run hard aground off Newport News earlier in the day while pursuing the marauding Virginia. The rebel ironclad Shirley would return in the morning to complete her destruction. Warden was ordered to take Monitor to defend Minnesota. An atmosphere of gloom pervaded the fleet, recalled Lieutenant Samuel Green. The pygmy aspect of the newcomer did not inspire confidence among those who had witnessed the destruction of the day before. The USS Congress blazed like a gigantic torch stuck in the mud where she had been pulverized by Virginia. Around 2 a.m., she blew up. Wrote Lieutenant Green, certainly a grander sight was never seen, but it went straight to the marrow of our bones. Near us too, at the bottom of the river lay the USS Cumberland with their silent crew of brave men who died while fighting their guns to the water's edge. The USS Monitor entered Hampton Roads, cleared for action, and anchored near the Minnesota. Her journey to this point had been as unprecedented as the impending battle. So let's step back a bit and look at her origins. New developments in naval armaments, larger guns, explosive shells, rifled boards, had had rendered wooden warships increasingly vulnerable, while significant improvements in iron armor had been made, as demonstrated in the recent Crimean War. A furious ironclad arms race was on in Europe. The French launched the first ironclad battleship, the Gloire, in November 1859. In 1860, the British produced a magnificent HMS warrior the first fully iron hulled warship and the most advanced, most powerful in the world. The US Navy had been in the forefront of developments in steam propulsion and naval armaments. In the 1840s and 50s, the Navy ceased building sail only warships while developing advanced wooden steam cruisers, culminating in the powerful Merrimack frigate class. These powerful warships were equal or superior to conventional European frigates. But America had no far-flung empire to defend and no neighboring threats. The United States naval strategy focused on harbor and coastal defense with swift cruisers like Merrimack to protect commerce in distant waters. Americans were content to allow Europeans to pursue costly experiments in unproven technology of iron armor. But secession and blockade altered the strategic picture dramatically. Europe, particularly Great Britain and France, suffered shortages of cotton, disruptions in industry, trade, and finance, high unemployment, social and political unrest. Great Britain seriously considered intervening on behalf of the Confederacy, perhaps forcefully. British support for rebel commerce raiding and blockade running enraged the United States. Arguments over the, over the roles and responsibilities of neutral countries in wartime harken back to 1812 and the revolution. The specter of a third war with Great Britain, the world's most powerful nation, now armed with, iron, with sea-going ironclads, became real and immediate. In the summer of 1861, Secretary of the Navy Gideon Wells struggled with the notion of ironclad vessels. It was a subject, quote, full of difficulty and doubt, he told Congress. England and France had built large, powerful sea-going ironclads. The United States had none. It was evident that a new and material element in maritime warfare was developing itself and demanded immediate attention. Iowa Senator James Grimes supported the development of ironclads. We need a more effective blockade. Scoundrels north as well as scoundrels south are carrying on an unlawful trade in fraud of our revenue. Pirates and sea rovers must be captured. Southern harbors and forts must be retaken. 
commerce must be protected and northern harbors depend, defended. Suppose England in her love for cotton should attempt to break our blockade and we should get into trouble with her. What is to become of our northern cities and our cities upon the coast? He wished to protect his country and preserve it in all its parts. Secretary Wells was overseeing an immense, unprecedented warship procurement and building program while instigating a nearly impossible continent-wide blockade. He concluded that it would not be advisable in the current crisis to commit heavy expenditures, quote, by way of experiment on unproven technology and ironclads. He recommended appointment of a proper and competent board to inquire into and report on the subject before Congress considered larger appropriations for operational vessels. The most immediate threats, however, were Confederate ironclads under construction in Norfolk, Mobile, and New Orleans, particularly the former USS Merrimack, now the CSS Virginia. The Mobile Register boasted that the new weapon would be a floating fortress that would be able to defeat the whole Navy of the United States and bombard its cities with their great size, strength, powerful engines, an invulnerable iron casing, she could easily destroy or disperse the blockading fleet. She could throw bombs into Fort Monroe. We hope soon to hear that she is ready to commence her avenging career on the seas. Northern, Northern opinion was aroused also. The Philadelphia Examiner thought it curious that the United States was so behind the age. If we intend to have a national naval force worthy of our power and pretensions, we shall have to build iron case vessels as France and England have done and are doing. Congress directed Secretary Wells to appoint an ironclad board to investigate plans and specifications for constructing iron or steel, iron or steel clad steamships or steam batteries appropriating for that purpose, one and a half million dollars. Matt, a well-selected three senior line officer, two Commodores, crusty old salts of the wood and canvas needed, veterans of the War of 1812, and one commander. The board advertised for proposals and from them recommended three designs to be produced simultaneously. The first two were conventional wooden hulls with iron cladding, broadside battery, steam propeller, and a sailing rig. They would become the USS New Ironsides and the USS Galena. The final board selection was proposed by Swedish engineer John Ericsson. The intense stocky Eriks Ericsson, born in 1803, had a long career in Sweden, England, and America, designing, building, and improving steam engines. He produced a host of inventions, including the shipboard steam condenser, and collected numerous patents. Ericsson's proposal possessed, recalled Secretary Wells, extraordinary and valuable features for coast and river blockade. It involved a revolution in naval warfare. President Lincoln remarked, all I have to say is what the girl said when she put her foot into the stocking. It strikes me there's something in it. Ericsson's low profile concept was inspired by Swedish lumber rafts. He never claimed to have invented the revolving armored turret the idea had been circulating among engineers for decades, but he was the first to successfully deploy it. <clears throat> the ironclad board had serious reservations, but reluctantly agreed to proceed. The plan addressed the critical requirement, a combat ready craft suitable for restricted waters to be rapidly constructed and deployed, 
in its favor were presumed in vulnerability, small size, shallow draft, and limited exposed target area. Worrisome unknowns included over-reliance on steam power, i.e. it had no sales, semi-submerged hull, questionable stability, and untried turret-mounted armament. The contract was signed on October 4th, 1861, for an ironclad, shot-proof steam battle. John, John Erickson and his backers, <laughs> sorry about that. John Erickson, and, John Erickson and his backers were to deliver the vessel complete and ready for service within an unprecedented span of 100 days for a price of $275,000. Erickson lit the fuse on a frenetic and incredibly complex manufacturing process. Using civilian facilities because naval shipyards had no capabilities to produce ironclad. He orchestrated a conglomerate of nine contractors and multiple subcontractors working simultaneously in at least seven Northeast cities to produce raw materials, angle iron, bar iron, plate iron, and rivets and finished components which were assembled at the Continental Iron Works in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. Most of these firms clustered around New York City and Albany, centers of steam engine and iron manufacturing. They applied methods and materials in common use for locomotives and other land products. Only Yankees could produce an experimental ironclad vessel from scratch in 100 days. Despite the rush, Erickson did not scrimp on furnishings and gadgets. The officers' closet-sized staterooms were appointed in Victorian opulence, which Erickson paid for out of his own purse. The crewmen slept in hammocks on a more utilitarian berth deck. Six-inch round glass windows or deck lights set in the deck overhead supplemented by oil lamps, provided meager illumination. Erickson crafted a compact 400 horsepower steam engine with a single cylinder, 40 inches in diameter, driving two horizontal pistons. Auxiliary steam engines, an uncommon feature at the time, drove the turret revolution and the ventilation blowers providing fresh air. A steam condenser provided fresh water. The guns were mounted in customized low profile friction carriages to dampen recoil in the confined turret. Erickson installed the first custom designed pressure flushing below the water line, water closets or heads. Surgeon Daniel Logue suffered the indignity of being blown off the seat by a jet of water when he operated the flushing valves in the wrong order. Gideon Wells selected, selected as commander, 27 year veteran Lieutenant John L. Warden. Warden had been captured by Confederates the previous year while running secret dispatches to Fort Pickens in Florida, becoming the conflict's first prisoner of war confined in Alabama for eight months before being exchanged, Warden was still ill and weak when he assumed command. Lieutenant Samuel Dana Green was named executive officer, second in command. The 22-year-old Marylander graduated from the United States Naval Academy of Annapolis in June, 1859. Green represented the young professional officer corps educated at the new school, steeped in new technologies, and fired in the crucible of war to lead the Navy into the 20th century. With little public notice on a drizzly morning of January 30th, 1862, monitors slid down the ways into the East River before a large spontaneous crowd. The New York Tribune wrote, the assemblage cheered rapturously as the strange looking craft glided swiftly and gracefully into its new element. Nearby vessels fired salutes. 
Predictions that she would break her back or slump upon launching were disproven. The CSS Virginia was expected to appear in Hampton Roads any day, so work continued around the clock to complete fitting out. Despite futile attempts at secrecy, journalists swarmed the ship, leaving in their reporting nothing to the imagination. Captain Warden sought volunteers from warships in New York Harbor. He described to them the probable perils of passage and the certainty of combat. Many more enthusiastically responded than were required. A better crew nor naval commander ever had the honor to command, he would write later. Few of them had pre-war sea service. Most were recent recruits with little or no maritime experience. Some were European immigrants and at least two were African-American. These volunteers endured a lot of ribbon from fellow seamen in a solemn and prophetic tone. One old salt proclaimed, you fellows certainly have got a lot of nerve or want to commit suicide one or the other. Several of the new volunteers took one look at monitor and promptly deserted. After a hurried and superficial testing, Monitor got underway for Hampton Roads on March 6, 1862. On the morning of Saturday, March 8th, as Monitor approached the entrance to Chesapeake Bay, a frustrated commander in chief convened a council of war to prod Major General George B. McClellan into action on his proposed campaign to capture Richmond. He planned to land at Urbana on the Rappahannock, but as General Joe Johnston fell back from Manassas, McClellan decided instead to invade the peninsula at Fort Monroe. Throughout that afternoon, telegrams filtered in as the former USS Merrimack, now the CSS Virginia, sallied forth into Hampton Road. The Merrimack is close at hand. The Merrimack is engaging the Cumberland at close quarters. The Congress is now burning, and so on. For a while, the news looked very badly, recalled Presidential Secretary John Hay. <clears throat> Secretary of War Edward M. Stanton ordered the news be made public at once to alert, to alert northern ports that they were in great danger. The next morning, Sunday, March 9th, wrote a senior treasury official, was as gloomy as any that Washington had experienced since the beginning of the war. Lincoln called an emergency session at the White House for a much alarmed cabinet. John Hay reported that the panic was intense at Willard's Hotel. Nothing was too wild to be believed. Presidential Secretary John Hay and John Nicolay characterized this cabinet meeting as, quote, perhaps the most excited and impressive of the whole war. Gideon Wells was asked what could be done to counter this formidable monster. The Navy Secretary had no answers beyond faith in the untried monitor. She should have arrived in Hampton Roads the day before but due to a break in the telegraph cable, they had no news of her. Wells recorded in his diary that, quote, the most frightened man was Secretary of War Edwin Stanton. He was at times almost frantic. Stanton's words were broken and denunciatory. The panic under which he labored added to the apprehension of others. According to Wells, Stanton insisted that the rebel ironclad would change the whole character of the war. She would destroy every naval vessel and take Fortress Monroe. McClellan's campaign against Richmond must be abandoned. General Burnside's forces must be recalled from the North Carolina Sound. The vital blockading base of Port Royal must be given up. Virginia would come up the Potomac, disperse Congress and destroy the capital. She might go to New York and Boston and destroy those cities or hold them for ransom. 
the Army Secretary was contemptuous of the notion that a two-gun iron raft could stop her. Secretaries Nicolay and Hay wrote that Stanton walked up and down the room like a caged lion. Secretary Chase was impatient. Secretaries Wells and Seward were hopeful. General McClellan was dumbfounded and silent. The president, however, was, as usual in trying moments, composed but eagerly inquisitive, critically scanning the dispatches, interrogating the officers, joining scrap to scrap of information, applying his searching analysis and clear logic to read the danger and find the remedy. But the possibilities of the hour were indeed sufficiently portentous to create consternation. <clears throat> Wells caustically described Stanton peering out the window of the presidential office with an expansive view down the Potomac, expecting a rebel shell or cannonball to land on the White House before they left the room. But Wells assured him that Virginia was so loaded down with armor, she could not venture outside Hampton Roads. She could not, quote, ascend the river in surprises with a cannonball. Certainly, she could not attack simultaneously every city and harbor on the coast. It would better become us, Wells advised, to calmly consider the situation and inspire confidence by acting so far as we could intelligently and with discretion and judgment. Stanton telegraphed governors in major cities in the North, instructing them to man their forts and place timber rafts and other obstructions at the mouths of their harbors. Preparations were made to block the Potomac. Finally, that Sunday afternoon, the chattering telegraph produced the lost message of the night before. Monitor had arrived and will take care of Virginia, it said. The president and his cabinet awaited the outcome. In Hampton Roads that morning, the USS Minnesota was still hard aground. The crew making hasty preparations to abandon ship with monitor anchored nearby. Fog lifting from the water about 8 a.m. revealed the CSS Virginia approaching. Monitor's captain declared, I'm sorry, Minnesota's captain declared the monitor's captain warden, if I cannot lighten my ship off the shore, I shall destroy her. Warden assured him, I will stand by you to the last if I can help you. No, sir, you cannot help me, was the reply. <clears throat> Within the dim claustrophobic metal drum of Monitor's turret, 20 feet in diameter, behind eight inches of iron, squatted the two immense 11-inch Dahlgren smoothbores. Lieutenant Green supervised 16 brawny sailors packed in eight to a gun. None of them had been drilled on these guns in this turret. Captain Warden took station on, on the pilot house platform near the bow, his head and shoulders in the box. Peering through the half inch viewing slit, jammed at his elbow was the pilot and the helmsman. The only communication between the pilot house and the turret was via runners between the two stations. In the below the turret, recalled Master, recalled Paymaster Keeler. Everyone was at his post, fixed like a statue. The most profound silence reigned. If there had been a coward heart there, its throb would have been audible. So intense was the stillness. I experienced a peculiar sensation. I do not think it was fear, but it was different from anything I ever knew before. We were enclosed in what we supposed to be impenetrable armor. We knew that a powerful foe was about to meet us. Ours was an untried experiment and our enemy's first fire might make it a coffin for us all. The suspense was awful as we waited in the dim light, expecting every moment to hear the crash of our enemy's shot. 
Warden charged directly for Virginia, placing the little monitor directly between Virginia and the foe. In the gloom below, Peter heard the muffled whump of a gun, and another, and another. Virginia and Minnesota blasted away at each other at long range, skipping shells along the water's surface. Rounds could take 20 to 40 skips. Several friendly rounds bounced off monitor. Hmm. Wrote Keeler, the infernal howl of the shells as they flew over our vessel was all that broke the silence and made it seem still more terrible. Captain Warden closed about a third of a mile, altered course and ordered, commence firing. The mammoth gun port cover rumbled open. The big black muscle protruded. Lieutenant Green yanked the firelock string at 8.45 a.m. The entire structure throbbed and trembled with a deafening concussion as the eight-ton behemoth leapt inward. Okay. The, the rebel ironclad turned her head upstream and replied with a broadside, followed by a volume of musketry which rattled on her iron deck like hailstones but caused no damage. These first shots made quite a sensation on worried gunners inside the turret. Warden expected that most rebel shots against the curved exterior would glance off without damage. But he worried that a shot fired directly in line with the vertical axis of the turret could deform the structure and jam the rotating mechanism. The captain also feared that hundreds of bolt and river heads holding together eight layers of one inch iron plates would blast off inside when they were hit outside, creating lethal projectiles among the men. In either case, monitor would be helpless. But he reported, a 150 pound projectile hitting straight on from 30 yards just created a smooth dent, a perfect mold of the shell two and a half inches deep. The indentation carried right through eight inches of plate without cracking and splitting the iron. Hmm. To everyone's relief, enemy fire did not dislodge a single rivet head and the turret continued to revolve. One rebel shell struck the vulnerable deck edge and tore up one of the plates. <clears throat> Worried that the blow might open a seam below the waterline, Warden crawled out of the gun port, walked to the side, lay down upon his chest to examine the damage, while bullets were zinging off the iron deck as thick as hailstones in a storm. The hull was uninjured except for a few splinters of wood, so he crawled back into the turret. <clears throat> the captain announced to the crew that Virginia could not sink them, if we let her pound us for a month, the men cheered. Guns bellowed through choking smoke, through choking white smoke shot with flame. Round scream, clang, boomed and splashed all around. Engines thumped and clanked. Blowers roared. Black clouds billowed from stacks. Big propellers thrashed the water. Men trapped inside, many stripped to the waist with scraps of cloth around their ears, shouted, sweated, and struggled to manage their metal monsters. Virginia's acting captain, Lieutenant Catesby Jones, reported, we were often within a ship's length of monitor. Once while passing, we fired a broadside at her at only a few yards distant. She and her turret appeared to be under perfect control. Her light draft enabled her to move, to move about us at pleasure. Ironclad against ironclad, recalled Monitor's chief engineer Stimmers. We maneuvered about the bay here and went at each other with mutual fierceness. They circled awkwardly in what would appear to a modern observer as slow motion. Recalled Lieutenant Green, Five times during the engagement, we touched each other. 
Each time I fired a gun at Virginia and will vouch the 168 pounds penetrated her sides. The shot, shell, grape, canister, musket, and rifle balls flew about us in every direction, but did us no damage. Our tower was struck several times, and though the noise was pretty loud, it did not affect us any. Inside the turret, two men leaned against the bulkhead, just as a rebel shot whanged against the outside, knocking them senseless. But both recovered by the following morning and were the only injuries among the crew. The effect of one shut up in a revolving drum is perplexing, wrote Lieutenant Green. Both vessels were continuously turning, backing and forwarding, while the turrets spun independently. This certainly was not your traditional man of war broadside gun deck. Green could see out only through the few inch gap between the gun muzzle and the top of the gun port, a favorite target for Eagle Rebel muskets on Virginia. Through smoke, noise, concussion, and the whirling of the turret, the lieutenant was disoriented and frequently blind. He could not see the enemy. A rebel projectile entering an open gun port would put them out of action. He could not see how his own guns were pointed relative to his own vessel. A careless round striking the pilot house directly in front of the turret would end the fight. <clears throat> To make matters worse, the steam-driven turret was slow to start, revolving, and once moving, slow to stop, even slower to reverse. Like all monitors machinery, <clears throat> these mechanisms were undergoing their first combat trial. Green found it nearly impossible to stop rotation in line of fire, open the heavy gun port, sight and shoot at a target that was itself moving. So he settled on a pattern. He rotated the turret away from Virginia and stopped to load both guns, leaving the gun ports open to save time and effort. Then when ready, start revolving again and fire both guns on the fly as the target swept past the muzzles. Green personally aimed and fired every round. To Virginia's Lieutenant John Taylor Wood, Monitor appeared but a pygmy. But in her size was one great element of her success, he wrote. The Monitor was firing every seven or eight minutes and nearly every shot struck. When Monitor's turret revolved, we could see nothing but two immense guns, recall the rebel marine. Those guns bellowed and promptly disappeared while his gun crew struggled to respond. Lieutenant Jones wondered how the Yankees could take aim so quickly. The Virginia, however, was a large target, he wrote, and generally so near that monitor shot did not often miss. It, not appear, it did not appear to us that our shell had any effect on monitor. Jones maneuvered his lumbering vessel for nearly an hour, trying to ram and board monitor. <clears throat> but Warden turned away and suffered only a glancing blow. In the process, monitor just missed Virginia's submerged stern, almost snapping off her rudder and propeller. As monitors slid by, Virginia's after pivot gun delivered a 68 pound rifle shell against the pilot house from about 20 yards. Captain Warden had his eyes close behind the viewing slit. The explosion cracked and almost broke the iron box, flooding it with light. Paymaster Keeler stood below the platform awaiting orders. A flash of light and a cloud of smoke filled the house, he wrote. I noticed the captain stagger and put his hands to his eyes. The blood was running from his face, which was blackened with powder smoke. 
My eyes, Warden said, I am blind, but do not mind me. Save the Minnesota if you can. Lieutenant Green came forward from the turret to assume command. The pilot and the helmsman were shaken, but not injured. Well, a stunned and partially blinded warden ordered the helm to starboard, turning monitor away from the action and into shallow water where Virginia could not follow and her guns could not reach. Seeing monitor withdraw, Minnesota's captain ordered every preparation to destroy the ship, but the rebel ironclad did not approach. Evening was descending, the tide was ebbing, Virginia was damaged and low on ammunition. Lieutenant Jones decided to retire with confidence that the contest could be resumed next day. Confederates would excoriate him for leaving Minnesota in enemy hands. Now in command of monitor, Lieutenant Green longed to re-engage, but Virginia was retreating. He had to cover Minnesota. Another hit on the pirate house could be disabling and their wounded captain needed attention. So at about 12.15, monitor let go a few last shots and turned away. Green also would be criticized for this decision by armchair admirals. Paymaster Keeler climbed up through the iron hatch to a deck strewn with shell fragments. Virginia's parting shot shrieked over their heads and exploded about 100 feet away. Small steamers and boats from Newport News, Fort Monroe, and the various men of war surrounded them, all eager to learn the extent of our injuries and congratulate us on our victory. Thousands of spectators were astonished to learn that Monitor was uninjured and ready to resume the fight. From the high deck of the Minnesota, Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Gustavus Fox, had seen the whole fight. He hailed down to Monitor that they had, had fought the greatest naval battle on record and behaved as gallantly as men could. Wrote Lieutenant Green to his parents. I felt happy and proud then mother and felt fully repaid for all that I had suffered. When told that Minnesota was saved, Warden said, then I can die happy. Future Admiral John Warden would recover most of the sight in his right eye, but his face was permanently blackened and his left eye destroyed. Monitor was struck 22 times, twice on the pilot house, nine on the turret, eight in the side armor, and three on deck. Lieutenant Green reported that his underclothes were black with smoke and powder. His nervous system was totally shot. Every bone in his body ached. He could hardly stand. My nerves and muscles twitched as though electric shocks were continually passing through them. My head ached as if it would burst. Sometimes I thought my brain would come right out over my eyebrows. I lay down, tried to sleep. I might as well have tried to fly. Thank you. Ready for questions. Thank you so much for that uh, excellent talk. Uh, so many great quotes in there and uh, some really good details. I know there were a few questions that came in and uh, other people uh, can submit questions as well as we're kind of getting off to a start here. And I do want to apologize. We had a lot of people come in late because of uh, some mess up with Eventbrite. I'm not exactly sure what happened, but I will definitely look into it and uh, see what we can do so that it doesn't happen again. So I'm looking for a question. I know there were there was one question that came in about the the visuals and the graphics that you used. And uh, could you tell us a little bit about where those uh, images come from and, and some of the drawings and maps? Well, yeah, the, the, the drawings, the graphics of the ship and the maps were all specially made for the book, and they are in the book. 
um, and um, the book will be available both in in um, in softbound as all the emerging Civil War series are, and it'll be available in uh, electronic format too. So uh, that's where those drawings are. They were specially commissioned for the book. Excellent. Thank you for that. And uh, this from Cindy, she says, I'm wondering if it was commonplace for men to place their hands on the knees of other men in photos, such as the one you just presented. And I'm not sure quite where in your talk this came in, but uh, she just noticed that. Well, there was probably the shot of the officers in front of the turret. Um, See and was that a common way to pose? Do you know, or I, I, I don't know. Um, I, I think there were probably. Let's see, what shot is up here? Um, there were probably different, different, different standards of um, of. Uh, oh, there it is. Um, Let's see, that was, that was the shot. Um, can you see that? Uh, no, I think you need to share. Oh, did my sharing go off? I'm okay, let me. All right. Okay, okay there we go. Yeah, oh, yeah, I, okay. I can see the gentlemen in there yeah, casually putting their hands on each other's knees. And Cindy <laughs> says, know. yes, that's I, the photograph that she was noticing. I frankly didn't notice that, but uh, yeah, I, I, I don't think that, that we can conclude anything from that particularly, except that's you know, just uh, uh, you know, the way they did things. <laughs> they look very chummy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I don't know if there are any other questions. I'm not seeing anyone. Uh, the I'll, I'll ask one question. The, the French ironclad that you mentioned, the Blois. Yes. Uh, do you know what became of that? Um, I, I don't know the specifics. Um, she never engaged in combat, as far as I know. Uh, she actually became outmoded pretty quickly. As a matter of fact, the, the HMS warrior put a, 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 a you know. A, of Celeste pretty quickly because the warrior was bigger uh, and uh, more heavily armed. And so the French and the British continued their arms race, but they didn't engage in actual uh, conflict with, with those ships. Um, they went through a, a, a standard career, but as far as I know, they never fired a gun in anger. Uh, the French ship was a wooden hold ship with iron plating. Uh, interestingly, the, the warrior was an the first all iron ship and that her, her framing and, and uh, uh, deck supports, uh, knees and so on were also iron. Uh, she, by the way, is a beautiful museum ship in Portsmouth if, if you're ever over there. Yeah, I've toured her and it, I was uh, just blown away by the warrior. Yeah. So there is another question. This from Donna, she said, how did you, oh, sorry, questions are pouring in. So let me uh, go back because it moved. How did they get fresh air into the innards of both vessels? Okay, well, that's, that's an excellent question in regard to the monitor. Let me find the uh, appropriate shot here. <clears throat> there was only one, one source of fresh air on monitor and this was a serious design deficiency. And there were centrifugal blowers, ventilation blowers here under the deck back in the engine room with short stacks up on top. And so these blowers, and there was another one on the starboard side, there were two of them, pulled air into the engine room and then circulated it throughout the vessel from there. Unfortunately, on the way down, she encountered some severe storms and these stacks were too short and they got water into the into, into the, both the smokestack and the ventilation stacks. And the, the, these, these blowers were driven from small auxiliary steam engines by leather belts. The, belt, the belts got wet and started slipping. The blowers stopped. The blowers stopped. Uh, 
the, the, the boilers ran out of air, the fires went down, the engine stopped, the pumps wouldn't work, and the ship almost sank until they towed it in the calmer water. So that was a severe problem. They did, they did take some steps to design them better in future classes. <clears throat> uh, the, the Virginia, uh, the, the top deck of the Virginia, uh, which is only about 20 feet wide, it, it didn't have any, any serious problems of those kind because the top deck was a grating, so it had got air through the grating as well through the gun ports. All right, thank you for that. And uh, John wants to know, did you manage to find any manuscript sources that no one else has used? Um, not that I know of, um, but I didn't. I didn't go back through all the all the secondary volumes see what they used. I just went and found the best primary sources I could and put them put them together in in what is probably a a, a uh, a, a way that nobody has done before. <clears throat> I, I don't know that I, I, I think I used some sources that people hadn't used before, uh, but not because they didn't know about them, they just chose not to, not to use them. Particularly some of the quotes from the, from the, uh, the sailors. Oh, well, there's one, um, which is in the book. I didn't really put in the presentation, but there was a young union te te telegrapher at, uh, uh, at uh, Fort Monroe, and he was standing on the ramparts when, when Monitor came in that evening, in the dusk of that evening. So on one side of him, he watched the Monitor approach the dusk, and on the other side, he, he watched the Congress burning madly in the harbor, and he watched the whole thing. And, and he has some pretty good quotes in, in, the, in the book. So I, I did find some stuff that you probably won't find elsewhere. And that was really one of my goals was to do just that to to to, to uh, tell this story as much as I could through through the uh, through the eyes of the people who lived it. You know, well, the uh, quotes you used were excellent. Yeah, well, there are a lot more in the book. Yeah. <laughs> and Peter wants to know um, if you can tell us what happened to the Monitor and the Merrimack or the Virginia. Oh, absolutely. Um, the Monitor hung around Hampton Roads for the rest of the summer. Well, she had a quick trip up to the to the Washington Navy Yard for some to, to for some repairs. Um, she went up the James and uh, tried tried to um, uh, bombard. Uh, uh, what's the what's the name of the of the fort down there on the on the on the point there uh, on the James? Anyway, you all know about it. <laughs> um, Finally, toward the toward the winter, uh, she uh, was ordered to go south and join some other ships for an attack um, uh, down south. So she was hooked up to a large seagoing uh, side wheel tug and was being towed down the south and around Cape Hatteras. They encountered a terrific storm and she was sunk there um, and off Cape Hatteras. Um, and then just in, um, you know, just in the 90s, she was recovered and the parts of her are now at the Monitor Center at the Hampton, Hampton Roads Naval Museum, which is, which is, uh, I'm, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Newport News, uh, Maritime Museum, Maritime Museum, <clears throat> which if you've never seen is a terrific place, one of the, one of the Neatest museums I've ever seen. Uh, the Virginia also hung around the roads and tried and tried to re-engage Monitor without success because the uh, the Navy said they didn't want Monitor to re-engage Virginia because she might be damaged and they didn't want to lose her. And um, uh, finally, when the uh, Union forces uh, retook uh, um, Norfolk and the Gosport Navy Yard, uh, the Confederates uh, had no choice but to destroy her. So they, they blew her up and, uh, and, uh, and sunk her there in the roads. And that's what happened to her.
You're, you're muted, Kelly. <laughs> I am. For some reason, my space bar wasn't working. Uh, and this is a, a little bit off the topic of this, but someone asked uh, if you can recommend a good book on the CSS Alabama. Oh, gosh. Um, the best book on the Alabama by far is Raphael Sam's Memoirs of Service of Float. Okay. It is, it is really one of, the, one of the classic memoirs in the war. It's a terrific sea story, but it's, it's written in a way that, that even land lovers can understand it and enjoy it. But it's also a terrific uh, uh, story of the war and uh, one, one, of the, one, of the, one of the leading men, one of the leading Confederates in the war. There have been uh, the shelves of, of books written on the Alabama since then. But if you want the real story, I'd recommend you go back and, and, and read the original because it's, it's better than all, all the ones. Uh, although there have been some good, um, more focused studies about the impact and, 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 and you know, the, the, the background issues that Sims would not have talked about. But uh, read, read the story first and then follow up with those. Excellent. And uh, Noah wants to know, what role did the battle play in Lincoln's push to seize Norfolk? Um, well, it was, it, it um, he came down shortly thereafter. Um, and he was, he was, he was of course thrilled with that, that Virginia had at least been neutralized, although not completely put out of commission. Um, and he came down to prod both the Navy and, and the Army into, into more action. And um, he, uh, he actually took command and, and, and planned with them the, the uh, amphibious landing that ended up taking Norfolk. Um, there's, a, there's another really good Emerging Civil War series book out on that, uh, on that story too. So, um, I, th I think he was he, he, he was he was pushed to, to come down and see what's going on himself and keep things moving. And then, uh, does your book cover the monitor's trip to Drury's Bluff? That was the name I was trying to come up a minute ago. <laughs> I, I was almost when I read that question thinking that that was that was what it was. Yes, Drury's Bluff is a great story, and no, the book doesn't cover it because of the of the space limitations of, of the series. I would love to cover it, but uh, it, it's a great story. The monitor came up, and the USS Galena, uh, which was the 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 uh, the other. One other ironclad was there also, <clears throat> but of course, uh, and several other gunboats. But of course, they did not succeed in uh, reducing Drury's Bluff. <clears throat> and they ended up withdrawing. Excuse me. Um, the monitor couldn't really elevate her guns far enough to do much damage. And with only two guns, her firing rate was so slow that she could she could not contend with a with a well manned uh, shore fortification, which is one of the problems with the monitors. Uh, it turned out that Galena's armor was too light, particularly on her deck, and the plunging fire fire from the bluffs just riddled her. Uh, she took a lot of damage, took a lot of casualties, put her out of action for a while. <clears throat> As an ironclad, she was pretty much a failure, actually. They ended up eventually taking off most of her armor and just making a, a mostly wooden uh, gunboat out of her. All right, and I think one last question. How long did it take to build the two ships and what was their cost? Okay, well, the monitor was contracted to be done in 100 days. He actually took a couple of weeks more than that to get it done, but, but nobody complained. And the... The cost, I think I quoted, was 270000 or $175,000, something like that. Um, Virginia took them uh, six plus months to convert 
the Merrimack Hall. They had raised the hall. Uh, the, I, I, you probably know the Merrimack had been burned to the waterline and sunk uh, when the Union abandoned uh, the, the shipyard. And uh, the Confederates took it over. They raised the hull, dragged it into the dry dock, and, um, and then built Virginia on top of the hull and, re and, and got the engines uh, repaired enough that they operated pretty much. Uh, but it, it, took them, it took them something like six months to do that. Um, and so the they, they, they Virginia actually started first, uh, uh, but the, uh, the, they ended up about the same time. All right. Well, thank you. And uh, thank you for this uh, talk tonight. Uh, so much wonderful information and uh, great detail. And again, uh, everyone, if you uh, are interested in the book, you can go to the Savas Beatty website. And if you want to use that code virtual, you'll get 20% off. Uh, once again, I apologize to those of you who had trouble getting in and I'm definitely going to look at that. And as always, go to our website, acwm.org, uh, for more information on upcoming programs. And if you ever have a question about a program, feel free to email me at khancock at acwm.org. But thank you so much uh, for uh, being with us tonight. And uh, everyone have a good evening. It's raining here in Richmond, so uh, if you're local, stay dry. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. I hope I hope you get down to your museum sometime in the near future.